Would you like to see several early Quran manuscripts with corrections of the word Allah? If so, stick around. That's exactly what we're going to do today, just after I answer a few of your questions from recent videos. Well, welcome back to Variant Quran. I'm Dr. Daniel Brubaker, and this is a channel where I am speaking about my research with Quran manuscripts, corrections and variations in the Quran manuscripts, and relate it to the larger conversation around these things. You stick around until the end today. I'm going to be speaking about corrections involving the word Allah. Hang around. Discussion. I wanted to answer a couple of your questions from the last video that I put up about the unboxing. I hope you enjoyed watching the unboxing, and I'm going to uh, put a link to that video here at the bottom. Thank you for being here, for being part of this community, and for watching these videos. It's been fun to get to know some of you and to hear from you that you are enjoying watching the things that I put up. It's gratifying, I think, to anyone to have people appreciate their work, and I do appreciate you appreciating me. So, uh, thanks so much. Here is the first comment. It says, much love and respect from Pakistan. Thank you, sir, for all you're doing. God bless you. And it's from Jamal Khan. Thank you, Jamal. It's great to have you here. And it's great that people are watching all the way over in Pakistan. Here's another one. It says, hi, sir. Did you teach this stuff? How long would you read a 300 to 400 pages of books? And uh, first of all, the books that I showed you the other day, first of all, First, com the, the common thing that people ask when they step into a library like this is, have you read all these books? And the answer is no, I have not read all of these books, but I have read many of the books. And the books that I showed you uh, in more direct answer to this question from uh, Miriam Buenaventura is that the books that I showed you on Saturday were not editions meant for reading the entire book. They were actually many pages of transcription of Quran manuscripts with introductions. So the introductions are for reading, but the books themselves are for reference. So thankfully, you can uh, maybe it was scary to see those books and think of uh, me sitting here reading away at them. Number one, I'm a fairly slow reader, so it is not as though I can breeze through all these things any faster than anybody else. Maybe faster than some people, but uh, probably quite a bit slower than many other people. It's just work. It's work like any other work, is, is reading and studying and trying to um, get a handle on a subject, and it takes time. So that's what I do. The next uh, comment here is greetings from uh, Indonesia, from uh, Anthony. Thank you so much, Anthony. Not only Pakistan, but we have Indonesia. Thank you. The next comment here is from, uh, well, it looks like a screen name, Libertatum Hobbit uh, Prescium. It says, good morning, Daniel. I have been following your pages with interest. I have noted a gentleman by the name of Haitham Sidki offer a critique of your work. Has there been a response to this? Is it worthy of a response? Those are two questions that are good questions. There has not been a response yet from me. I don't know if anybody else has made a response to it yet, although I have noticed that different people have picked up his review and used it as a basis for uh, further critique of uh, my work, including uh, Shabir Ali in his response to my book. Now, um, my response to it is forthcoming very soon and is not out yet, but it's coming soon. Is it worthy of a response? Well, actually, the, the review has a number of flaws to it, some of which I'll be mentioning in my response to it. So that's coming soon. And uh, you can judge for yourself whether it was worthy of a response. But initially, I didn't respond very quickly because I didn't feel that it was necessarily needed right away. But uh, now I do feel that it is needed because people are talking about it. And uh, so they do need to hear what, uh, what I think. All right. So the next uh, comment here is from Romano Productions. It's says, hello, Dr. B. Nice to see you and in good shape. I hope you will be fine for a long time. This video is not extraordinary, but still the unboxing is a mandatory style of video and you've done a proper job as a YouTuber. Well, thank you for that. And then he continues on to say that the uh, thumbnail is okay because I have a pleasant smile, but it could have been a little bit more clickbait, put an object, blur the object, and put a question mark over it, or different type of objects with question marks all over to spice up the thumbnail to push the user to watch the video. It's YouTube, it needs to be clickbait. And so um, the, reason, the reason I share this with you is, and uh, the reason I respond to it is that uh, I understand I'm in a particular medium uh, but I wanted you all to understand that it's kind of a tension for somebody like myself to be in this environment. There is something that feels, uh, although I have worked in the past in, in sales, and I do recognize the importance of, of marketing and merchandising your wares, so to speak, 
uh, and putting things out in a way that are attractive and draw people in to look at them. And so I am trying to do things like that, but uh, but I also do not want to be artificial in the way that I do things or uh, too disingenuous in, in, in the way that I go about this. So hope you'll bear with me as I sort of strike my balance and find my stride and my style in this uh, in ways that don't compromise what I really want to be, a sense of being genuine with you and and honest and so forth. Although I hope you'll also on the back, on the, on the flip side of that, pardon me if you do see things that look a little bit uh, uh, click baity as I experiment around with these things because I do, after all, want people to take the time to click and to watch these videos. It's the reason I'm doing them is so that people will watch. So thank you for that, uh, Romano, for those good um, comments that you're offering to me uh, in order to help me to build and to expand this channel. So the last one I'm going to talk about today is the OMSA. In our part of the world, we never see these manuscripts, let alone can afford it. Yet Quran is still true, and we never argue about it. We never heard Sana or Birmingham or Topkapa manuscripts, let alone see them. Yet our Quran is the same as Quran of other Muslims. This is because Quran is preserved by recitation and memorization. All right, well, thank you for that comment, and uh, I don't want to get involved in argument around uh, these things. That's not the reason that I'm uh, up here doing this, but I wanted to put it up here and, number one, recognize that I understand that the the feeling of orality, that there's a strong sense that the oral transmission of the Quran has been the primary way that it has been passed down, and I also understand the strength of oral culture and the strength of people's ability to memorize the Quran even today. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that the Quran was always passed orally in the same way that it is today. It may well have been. I'm open to all of these possibilities, but I want to make clear that when I'm looking at the manuscripts, what I am trying to, the way that I'm using them, just so that you all understand, I may have said this before, but when I'm look, when we look at the manuscript, what we have in the manuscripts is a sort of a distillation, like if you were out on a vacation and you see a, a beautiful sunset and you decide to take out your camera and you take a picture of the sunset and then the sun goes down, everybody goes their different ways, you go on and you're later on you're remembering your vacation and maybe uh, after your vacation you remember the sunset one way or or another way but what you can do is you look back at that photograph and you can catch the details of that moment and so what we see in the manuscripts i think is a ca capturing of the details of a moment now later trend traditions relate to us certain things about the early transmission of the Quran, such as that it was transmitted orally, and we have the isnads, the chains of transmitters going back, that so-and-so heard from so-and-so about these different things, and we have isnads for the different verses and so forth. What we have in the manuscripts is additional evidence that is a snapshot of what somebody who was writing that down at that moment perceived uh, to be the text of the Quran at the moment that that was being written. And so any one manuscript is not necessarily uh, the end of the the end of the story or a full picture, but many manuscripts taken together and the evidence that they contain can help us to validate the narrative of that we've heard through the secondary sources, such as the Hadith, or to uh, give us increasing clarity about it in form of greater detail about something that the Hadith say, or possibly even in some cases, let us know that maybe what this Hadith is saying is not um, strong in this spot uh, on this particular point of detail because we have manuscripts that, that show us something a little bit different. So I don't know, I haven't fully unpacked these things, and one of the things in my response to the review, just to give you a little foretaste of that, to the review of Sidki, that Sidki wrote is that there was an expectation on his part and the part of some other people that I should unpack, that I should have done a full review and thorough survey of every one of these corrections before I ever announced that it existed to the public. And that's I just so that you know, that's not what I've chosen to do. I've put out basic descriptions of many of these corrections. Uh, what verse is it? What is going on on the page? What portion of the text has been erased? What portion has been overwritten? Is it a different ink? Does it look like there was a passage of a good deal of time between original composition of the page, the original production of the page, and the correction of it? Uh, or does it look like it was done soon after the time of first correction? For example, with the text of the correction matching the style and nib and ink of the rest of the page. 
And so those are the kind of things that I've looked to describe. And I've begun down the path of analyzing what's going on. Does this look like a scribal mistake? And, you know, I'm not going to say that I won't change my opinion at some point of some of these things. If I thought that something was not a mistake at some point, and then later, either by have, having it pointed out to me by somebody that, oh, these details of it do show that it, it was a mistake, then I would be open to uh, looking at that and reevaluating, or, you know, or vice versa. These details show that it probably wasn't a mistake when maybe I thought it was a mistake. So uh, that is something that happens over time. But the job of thorough and deep analysis of all these thousands of changes is not something that one person can necessarily take on. I could spend a lot of my life doing it, but uh, I'm not going to likely succeed in plumbing the depths of every single one. And so I've decided to begin publishing these things, make them out known to you so that you also can have a look and think about what they might mean in the meantime. So I hope that makes that clear and I hope it's helpful to you. All right. So what I'm going to do now is jump over into the substance of what we'll talk about today. I'm not going to go extensively into the matter of a lot corrections in the Quran today. Instead, I'm going to give you a couple of examples to give you a sense of the nature of it. If you'd like to read more about it, you can see it in my book. And uh, you can also see it in a chapter that is forthcoming that I just finished up this past week and submitted the final form, approved the final form for the forthcoming edition of the uh, German Ara books. In my book, Corrections in Early Quran Manuscripts, I speak about, in example three, corrections involving the word Allah. And there I give nine examples of corrections involving the word Allah, pages 34 to 44, and give some discussion about those. The reason I included that in my book is that I had come across about a dozen examples involving corrections, insertions of Allah, and there are many other places, numerous other places, where there are corrections involving the word Allah. Now, that should not be at all surprising, given the fact that the word Allah occurs in the Quran over 2,800 times. It's a very frequently occurring word, so we shouldn't be necessarily surprised that it's corrected frequently. However, there were interesting features about the corrections that I had found, in particular a number of places in a single manuscript or several manuscript fragments coming originally from the same manuscript, from the same bound book, had insertions of Allah after the fact that had been omitted at the time of first writing, and the density of those was surprising to me. I'm not going to go into all those things today. I am, however, going to give you several examples of the types of corrections involving Allah, one um, involving the replacement of the word Allah with, uh, or where, where the word Allah replaces the pronoun. So the first one we're looking at today is from Marcel 5, folio 11R. This is in St. Petersburg. And this comes from Surah 34, verse 27. It is the only instance of Allah in this verse, and as it was written in this manuscript, it looks like it was omitted at the time of first writing and the huwa, he is, was the only thing written. So the verse as it was first written uh, appears to have said, say, show me those you have attached to him as associates. He is rather the almighty, the all-wise, as opposed to how it reads today, which is, show me those you have attached to him as associates. Allah is rather the mighty, the all-wise. So that is one example of the replacement of the pronoun with the word Allah, and there are several others in this chapter that I just submitted for this volume. The second manuscript I'm going to show you today is an insertion of Allah. As you can see, it was later than the time of original production. It's clearly a different nib and ink. It looks almost as though it could have been done in modern times. And the verse is Al-Araf 44. The word preceding the correction here, so the Allah is written in a superscript, but the word just slightly to the right of that is the word la'natu, which means curse. So as it's written now in this manuscript, it reads la'natullahi ala zalimin, meaning the curse of Allah is upon the wrongdoers, or may Allah's curse be upon the wrongdoers. And as it was first written in this manuscript, without the word Allah, it would have said la'natu ala zalimin, a curse is upon, or may a curse be upon the wrongdoers. And so it makes sense, and by the way, the way it exists in this manuscript now with the Allah there is the way that it exists in the Hafs text. All right, moving on, we're going to go to the last pair of corrections in different manuscripts at the same verse, and that verse is Surat al-Hazab 73. And uh, both of these have the word, well, the first one is Marcel 11, which is in St. Petersburg. It's on 10 verso, and you can see that there has been an insertion of the word Allah here. 
And as I believe it first read in this manuscript, it was written, Wa yatuba ala al mu'minina wal mu'minat that he might pardon the believing men and the believing women. And uh, I believe what was done is it was erased and the word Allah was written in here because that is the explicit object and it is now in conformity with what is the standard Hoff's text. So the second, uh, and that was actually the second correction of this verse that I came across. The first one we'll flip over to now is in BNF Arab 340 and I mentioned this one in my doctoral dissertation. It's on Folio 23 Verso at line 16. And the superior text here starts in the same verse, actually, of uh, al-Mushrikin, at the uh, earlier in the verse, and it goes through the word Allah, which is right after the word Allah that was inserted above here, and that is the um, right, I'm sorry, leftmost word in the previous slide. So this whole portion of text, it is the last line of the page, has been uh, erased and overwritten. It's a little bit bunched in, although it, you see it is stretched out. The word Allah is stretched out there at the end of the line. Uh, the word Allah is a little bit bunched in there too, but not too bunched compared to the rest of the page. But you can see that this is a narrower nib, probably a different um, a different scribe and, and sometime post, uh, post-production, although it's not entirely certain it's possible that it was um, something that was done by a second scribe uh, somewhere as part of the in, original production process. So that's all that I'm going to show you today, and I just wanted to run that example of two verses by you that are corrected in the same spot, not to suggest that the same issue is going on here, because I don't think it necessarily was. In fact, I would be surprised that it was, because it would be easier, it would have been easier to correct it without erasing the whole line, if what was done in the operation in the first instance was similarly what was done in the second one. But we do have an overlap of corrections at the same spot, and I just wanted to whet your appetite a little bit because in coming weeks, and I'm not sure if it'll be the next video, but uh, in coming weeks I do have a verse in the Quran that has been corrected in at least four different manuscripts, the same portion of text or an overlapping portion corrected in multiple manuscripts. So I will be going over that at some future video, maybe soon. And I do want to remind you that we have now set up the Patreon account. If you are interested in helping me out in doing this, making this work possible for me, I do appreciate your help. And you can see the link below in the description box. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you again next time.